the uh, National uh, Interest Foundation. And what I'd like to do is, um, I'll, I'm gonna start the panel by just reading a little opening statement to frame the debate. And then we're gonna go in uh, alphabetical order and have each of the presenters uh, lay out their focus because then we'll take questions and answer like the last panel. So U.S. foreign policy has generally emphasized the promotion and protection of human rights as a core principle. The United States has, a his has historically positioned itself as a champion of human rights globally, advocating for civil liberties, political freedoms, and the protection of all populations. It is important to note that the feelings and priorities within the United States foreign policy and human rights can vary from different administrations, reflecting on the diverse perspectives and appropriate and approaches of different leaders. Public opinion, the best political dynamics, the evolving global context can also influence the overall sentiment and direction of U.S. foreign policy. One of the persistent challenges for the U.S. is striking a balance between national security and economic concerns while upholding human rights principles. The, the dilemma often arises in the context of how we treat and engage various allies, counterterrorism efforts, surveillance programs, and even the treatment of uh, detainees. The consistency of U.S. foreign policy regarding human rights has varied over time and across different administrations. The approach to human rights as a U.S. foreign policy can be influenced by a range of factors, including the geopolitical considerations, the national interests, alliances, <coughs> domestic politics, and the evolving global dynamics. The objective of this panel is to broadly discuss the challenges of current U.S. foreign policy in their relationship to human rights. The human rights landscape is dynamic. The U.S. foreign policy is constantly evolving and changing. We will attempt to explore new and innovative potentially, potential approaches that we might and should consider as a country. We hope to at least begin to address some of our current foreign policy practices, offer proposals and possible solutions to current issues relating to human rights. So exploring the potential issues that may arise from implementing these new policies and weighing them against the current issues that we face around the world. So with that, let's have each of the panelists share their perspectives for 10 to 12 minutes. We'll take questions and engage the discussions of how we might be able to help find more innovative and better approach. So with that, if I could just introduce each of the panelists and if they could just say a little bit about each other, about themselves so the, so the audience knows who they are, we'll go from there. So in alpha order, Sahara Aziz, you go first. Lucky you. I think you just gotta pull it closer and talk, they should all be on. My name is Sahara Aziz. I'm a law professor and Chancellor Associate Nelson Scholar at John Durge University in Boston. I'm also the executive director of the Center for Security Race Rights, which is the full name to first civil rights center at a U.S. law school that focuses on the civil Ukraines of Muslims, Arabs, and the South Asians here in the U.S. as well as abroad. And it is my distinct pleasure to be on this uh, distinct panel. And thank you so much to the National Interest Foundation for inviting to participate. And thank you to Hadis Abudin and his team and for all the ones who will be organizing this important event. So as an academic, I would be remiss not to um, use my position to try to frame the follow-up in hopes that my colleagues will add in a little bit of all the details that you need to the RDA. So my comments today center on the two overarching questions that are frequently brought up in debates about human rights and U.S. war policy in the Middle East and North Africa. The first is whether our country takes human rights seriously or merely uses human rights strategically to further our geopolitical interests, easily our foes and our allies. The second is whether human rights impedes or enhances our interests in the region. So I'll start with the justifiable critique that our government participates and selective, politicized enforcement of human rights laws and policies to serve its geopolitical interests in furtherance of one goal, to remain the sole great power in the Middle East and North Africa, replacing the French and British after World War II. This geopolitical objective is betrayed by five pillars. First, to retain control over the distribution and price of oil below the market. Second, to maintain over 30 military bases in the region. Third, to keep the Middle East as the largest purchaser of U.S. military equipment, accounting for 49% of all U.S. arms exports, 
with Saudi Arabia alone accounting for 18% of all military sales, totaling $9 billion between 2013 and 2017. Fourth, the unconditional support for the State of Israel and the U.S. outpost in the Middle East and North Africa. And finally, to ensure that all Arab leaders place U.S. geopolitical interests ahead of their own citizens in their foreign policy decisions. Hence, when we examine the response, or lack thereof, of our government to human rights violations through this great power paradigm, the contradictions between our lofty rhetoric domestically and our actions abroad make sense. Enforcing human rights against our declared enemies, such as Iran and Syria, and Iraq before 2003, is a stick. While looking the other way, that our allies violate human rights is the carrot in our geopolitical agenda. So a brief overview of the practices of Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, or Israel, which my esteemed panelists will likely go into more detail, and I'll touch on this just quickly to show that the U.S. government consistently conducts business as usual in its relations, irrespective of our allies' human rights weapons. Egypt has imprisoned, since 2013, tens of thousands of political prisoners for the offenses such as insulting the president or insulting the judiciary or spreading false news after trials that lacked any semblance of due process theories. Saudi Arabia butchers, literally, its dissident journalists, including Jannan Fashobi, or conducts mass executions of 81 political dissidents for political offenses such as, quote, disrupting the social fabric and national cohesion, the country, end quote, and for, quote, participating in and inciting sit-ins and protests, end quote. United Arab Emirates convicts political dissidents in mass trials for calling for parliament the Democratic Parliament, or if suspected of just mere association with the Muslim world. Israel has established an elaborate system of apartheid that for over 60 years has dehumanized and collectively punished millions of Palestinians based on racist notions of Jewish supremacy and Arab interiority. An ancient Jew ally has a record of torturing its political prisoners through brutal oh. violence, denial of urgent medical care, or indefinite solitary confinement. Nevertheless, our government continues to conduct trade, sell military arms, and invite their rulers to the White House. And when our allied nations do not cooperate, our government officials suddenly discover the importance of human rights through mild condemnations and temporary halts on a tiny fraction of the foreign aid. In stark contrast, the U.S. government takes on the mantle of global human rights defender in its dealings with its stated enemies. The State Department publicly condemns Iran for, quote, brutal attacks of violence against peaceful protesters and an ongoing repression of the Iranian people. Our Congress issues resolutions stating, quote, condemning the Iranian regime's human rights abuses against the brave women and men of Iran peacefully demonstrating more than 133 cities, end quote. And the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom denounces Iran's pursuit of death sentences on religiously grounded charges against protesters asserting their freedom of religion or belief. And all of this, notwithstanding that our government, the United States government, issued a Muslim ban with the blessing of our Supreme Court. While simultaneously propping up authoritarians in ally countries, the United States government condemns the autocracy of Syria. The Assad regime's human rights violations are censored, as they should be, but similar violations are glossed over when our allies are the perpetrators. These glaring inconsistencies undermine the relevance of human rights law in U.S. foreign policy, making human rights merely a tool in the geopolitical toolkit as opposed to an international set of norms to which all countries must be held accountable, including the United States of America. So it is no surprise then that the Israeli government flippantly dismisses allegations of systemic racism 
that perpetuates massive seizures of Palestinian land and property, unlawful killings, forcible transfers, drastic movement restrictions, and the denial of nationality and citizenship to Palestinians. So this brings me to the second question of whether human rights impedes or enhances our interests in the region and within our own country. Why should we as citizens of this nation paying taxes that fund our government's support, directly or indirectly, of regimes that violate human rights, even bother to care about human rights? The answer lies in the type of world and the type of country we want to live in. The biggest losers from the absence of human rights enforcement are civilians all over the world, including us, who can no longer rely on these universal norms to protect our shared humanity. For it is preserving this shared humanity that distinguishes between a world where raw power in the form of wealth, arms, and control defines how we treat each other as people and as nations. Human rights law sets the minimum threshold of dignity that we all deserve regardless of the circumstances of our birth, which country, which neighborhood, which parents, which race, which religion from which we belong. Failure to hold all nations accountable for human rights violations sends a clear message. The law does not matter. That is, might makes right. And once these rules are the norms, we reopen the same gates of hell that we saw in World War II when millions of Jews were marched into death camps to be slaughtered like animals. Genocide awaits at the end of the path that starts with the normalization of human rights violations, as we have witnessed in Burma against the Rohingya. When the rich and powerful can abuse you with impunity, the response is more violence, whether through insurgency, revolution, guerrilla warfare, or terrorism. Non-state actors respond in kind to abusive governments that stripped its citizens of their humanity. The result of permanent repression of political rights is a region rife with instability, and conflict that is not contained to one country or region. And while this state of affairs may indeed enrich the US defense industry as the demand for military weaponry increases, the conflicts have created fertile soil for global terrorist groups that target the United States, precisely because it props up nations that systematically violate human rights and deny their citizens basic political freedoms, either with our government's blessing or our neglect. If the two decade long US led global war on terror has taught us anything, it is that our own country is less safe and we, its citizens, are less free when national security becomes the guise under which we abandon the rule of law, including adherence to human rights laws. Falling for the same fear-mongering deployed by autocrats to justify human rights violations, we, the, United, the US citizens, granted our government more authority to surveil, investigate, and prosecute individuals on account of their Muslim identity and their disagreement with our nation's foreign policy in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Israel. And for more on that, I'll just put a plug in for my book, The Racial Muslim and Racism Quashes Religious Freedom. So in our names and with our money, the US government tortured Muslims and Arabs in Abu Ghraib, in Guantanamo Bay, in CIA black sites, confirming what the people in the Middle East and North Africa have always believed. Human rights is merely a tool that Western states use against their political foes, not a set of universal norms that apply to everyone. Indeed, the global war on terror proved to be a boon for the autocrats across the globe, especially in the Middle East and North Africa, who need only label political dissidents as terrorists to legitimize the murder, torture, mass expulsion, or indefinite detention of individuals they deem a threat to their grip on power. So where does this leave us as citizens of an increasingly interconnected world? who in the age of social media and the internet can no longer claim ignorance of what our country is doing in our name and with our money. Supporting dictators, supporting apartheid, selectively defending the human rights of those who share the same identities as our elected officials, white and Judeo-Christian, 
while dehumanizing Arabs and Muslims at home and abroad. Now to be sure, that we are today able to express our dissent without threat of arrest speaks to the promise that this land and this country holds in being an exemplar of political freedom. But let there be no mistake, when we walk out of this room, some of us will be vilified, we will be attacked, and we will be blacklisted by the media, by our elected officials, and by special interest groups for daring to be Muslim and Arab and critical of an American foreign policy that treats Palestinians as animals, not human beings. For daring to actually take seriously our nation's stated commitment to human rights for all, including Muslims and Arabs, regardless whether the violator is a geopolitical ally or our own nation. For it is we the people, not our government, who are left carrying the burden of guarding our shared universal humanity. Thank you. So back to Andrea Passel of the Freedom Initiatives. If you hold that microphone closer, Jim, make it easier. Right? Remember to mind for a short table. I'll do my best. Thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. So um, I'm going to try to be brief because I'm looking forward to questions and conversation, though I, I think we're leaving that to the end. So take note if you have questions or comments from me. Um, and, and drill down a little bit more specifically, as, as Sahar said, that was really a wonderful overview. And I want to talk about, a, as we love more male issues related to U.S. foreign policy and human rights. My name is Andrea Prasso. I'm the executive director of an organization called the Freedom Initiative, which is dedicated to pursuing the release of political prisoners in the Middle East and North Africa and ending the systems of political detention that keep them there. So the question we've been presented here today is in part, what is wrong with US foreign policy, which is a great question. We could be here for many days uh, to have that conversation. But specifically, what I think is wrong with US foreign policy with respect to human rights is that that's a topic of conversation. What is wrong with US foreign policy with respect to human rights? Instead of human rights is an integral part of US foreign policy. The conversation that we have often, because it's necessary, is how can the U.S. better integrate human rights into its foreign policy? There's a consistent debate about weighing national security interests against human rights. Of course, we had famous words by then President Obama saying that, no, there's, there's no such balancing act. In fact, these things are, are integrated, and yet we have yet to, to see that actually implemented in U.S. policy. So the biggest problem, in my view, of what is wrong with U.S. foreign policy is that we have to have this conversation, that every decision, every policy, every thought about how the United States engages in the world is not completely infused with notions of human rights, because American foreign policy should reflect, reflect American values, which despite what we do see on a daily basis in our current political environment, I continue to believe are values of freedom and democracy and respect for human rights. Mm. Now, the second issue I want to raise is that, of course, as Sahar mentioned as well, when we do discuss human rights, U.S. policy is entirely inconsistent. So it's not the case that there is no conversation at the political level about the importance of human rights in U.S. foreign policy. In fact, as you'll recall, President Biden pledged to center human rights in U.S. foreign policy. Secretary Blinken made similar commitments. And yet an examination of U.S. foreign policy of the Biden administration clearly demonstrates that that is not the case, at least not the case all the time. And if it's not the case all the time, it's simply not the case. I think uh, the exception sort of proved the rule. So I'll discuss briefly the work we do at the Freedom Initiative, which focuses primarily on political prisoners in Egypt and Saudi Arabia as case studies of where US policy has been utterly either inconsistent or just wholly absent when it comes to respect for human rights. So, one of the, the fascinating things about working on the issue of political prisoners is that there's actually universal appeal. I have never had a meeting with anyone, Republican, Democrat, anywhere in the US government who thought it was a great idea to have political prisoners. Nobody thinks people should be in prison because of their thoughts, words, and beliefs, because of a tweet or a blog, or because their family member might tweet or blog. Uh, so the starting point in discussing U.S. policy towards countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia with respect to political prisoners is actually shared values, the belief that this is a problem, that the systems need to be changed, 
and potentially that the United States can play a role in that. But then when it comes to the practical realities, that's where, that's where things fall apart. And things fall apart not because people are not well-intentioned, not because politicians don't raise human rights privately and publicly, they do. But one of the things we've seen around the world is that actions speak much louder than words. So when we look at the case of Saudi Arabia, for example, um, first to, to go back to, to 2014, when I, I first started working on Saudi Arabia, um, there was very little political conversation in the US with respect to Saudi Arabia. When the war in Yemen began, suddenly there was an opportunity to have a conversation. Of course, the conversation was primarily about how can the US continue to support the Saudi-led coalition in its military campaign in Yemen. And even as uh, human rights violations were consistently documented, law of war violations were consistently documented, it was very difficult to get people in Washington to pay attention. Instead, the focus was support for Saudi Arabia consistently. Um, of course, there, were, there was dissent and there continues to be um, really important conversations and ultimately the US changed some of its posture in terms of supporting that military campaign. But it was nearly impossible to have a conversation about the domestic human rights situation in Saudi Arabia, even if people would listen to a conversation about Saudi Arabia's foreign policy, until, of course, Jamal Khashoggi was murdered. Then suddenly we saw a massive political shift, but it was a very brief one. So for a brief period of time, it was um, de rigueur in Washington to be outraged about Saudi Arabia's human rights violations. Uh, politicians on both sides of the aisle were consistent in condemning the conduct. And ultimately, as, as many of you know, the United States conducted its own intelligence assessment of who was responsible for Jamal Khashoggi's murder and concluded that Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince and de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, had ordered his murder. It's findings like these that led President Biden to say on the campaign trail that Saudi Arabia should be treated, and Mohammed bin Salman in particular, should be treated as a pariah. And then we fast forward to last summer, we will all recall the famous fist bump between Biden and Mohammed bin Salman, allegedly designed to avoid a handshake. Um, nevertheless, it's, uh, it's the fist bump seen around the world, which sends a really powerful message to Saudi Arabia's rulers and to Saudi dissidents around the world, that the United States would stand with the Saudi regime, not with the Saudi people. We saw an almost identical result when it comes to Egypt, where there are estimates of 50 to 60,000 political prisoners. I was fortunate enough to be in Egypt last November during COP27, the UN climate conference, hosted in Sharm El Sheikh uh, when the US delegation was present. Uh, as you may recall, there were some important public and, and I assume private conversations about human rights, including uh, US government officials urging the release of political prisoners in Egypt. Uh, we have a remarkable experience of human rights organizations coalescing with environmental rights organizations, sharing the view that you can't stand up for environmental rights when some of the very environmental rights defenders who should be a part of the conversation are in political prisons down the road. So we have this incredibly important moment with robust dialogue, conversations that people never would have dreamed of to take place on Egyptian soil. And then Hours later, after the photos of Nancy Pelosi with her arm around President El Sisi, after President Biden spoke publicly and didn't mention human rights at all, I was sitting with Egyptian human rights activists who's to, who were crestfallen. This moment where the United States could have stood up in support of them, their rights, of their beliefs, regardless of whatever was said, whatever was printed, uh, the message was very clear. Those photographs were shared instantaneously around the country. The message, again, was very clear. The United States does not stand with the Egyptian people. It stands with the Egyptian authoritarian regime. And so while I believe the well-meaning government officials who tell me time and time again that they raised human rights, that they urged the release of political prisoners, the State Department sends lists of names demanding the release of political prisoners, all of that is true, but it is almost meaningless when the very high level action by the president and his staff send a very different message. If we return to Saudi Arabia briefly, it's not only the president's trip to Jeddah. Um, there have been a dozen, if not more, visits by senior US government officials over the last couple of years. During the, the oil price wars, the US threatened to, that there was, it was time for a reset of US-Saudi relations, a reset 
that is no longer mentioned and we certainly haven't seen. Instead, we've seen the US green light a sale of airplanes to the tune of $37 billion to the Saudis. Um, so time and time again, we see, if we're lucky, rhetoric about the support for human rights, rhetoric about censoring human rights in US foreign policy, but sadly, very little action. So I know that, um, and, and I, I just want to flag some of the implications of that, aside for what's happening in those countries. Yesterday, Reuters reported that um, the UAE, which is hosting COP28 next year's, or uh, this year's UN climate conference, uh, has invited Bashar al-Assad. Whether he attends or not, what that room might look like, um, I, I don't know. I think that's a, that's a question for later. But what's, what's more important is that the UAE thought it was okay to do that, that Egypt could host a climate conference and be feted by uh, the global community. The UAE can do the same and invite all the various leaders, including uh, Assad, who, of course, has a special place among authoritarian rulers. Um, so I want to talk briefly about solutions, and then, again, look forward to your questions and comments. Um, you know, at its most simple, I, I will talk about some innovative solutions, but at its most simple, the U.S. could live up to its rhetoric. The U.S. could actually place human rights at the core of its foreign policy, could make decisions about what is best for the human rights of global citizens, including American citizens. And, and that brings me really to my second point, which is the bifurcation of domestic and foreign policy and how deeply problematic that is. One of the reasons I think it's easy to separate human rights from what's seen as sort of core foreign policy is because foreign policy itself is seen as other. The, the budget, despite what people think, is you know, marginal. Um, the number of people, even though in our circles we think everybody talks about foreign policy all the time. If you travel through most of the country, foreign policy conversations just don't take place. Ukraine is one of the few issues that, that permeated the American consciousness. And I think that's a choice that politicians make because they don't get constituent calls on most foreign policy issues. They can vote however they like without any consequences at home. And until that is fundamentally changed, until the American people believe that the price of gas is a foreign policy issue, that the price of wheat is a foreign policy issue as they have started to battle through some of these major global crises, I don't think we will see a fundamental shift in Washington because there aren't sufficient pressures urging politicians to do things differently. They don't get elected on foreign policy issues. If we're lucky, there is a foreign policy debate every presidential debate season. Sometimes there isn't. There's just not enough interest, which is remarkable because for those of us who work in this area, foreign policy is domestic policy. Every decision that the United States makes at the highest level has second, third, and fourth order effects that people y'all hear come. They just may not realize it. Um, so my, my second recommendation is to search for ways to really integrate foreign policy and domestic policy. Some of that happens at the social movement level, um, and that's some of the exciting intersections we saw, for example, at the UN Climate Conference. As many of you know, um, the movement for Black Lives has freedom for Palestine as one of its tenets. We're seeing more and more that activists recognize that all of these global issues are intertwined. We don't see that at the US domestic political level yet, and I think it's up to all of us to help make that happen. And then I just want to flag a couple of very brief innovative ideas because you can call for innovation. Um, the first is, is to flag for anyone who hasn't seen yet um, this morning. There's an exciting announcement by the uh, People's Vision for Reform in Saudi Arabia. It's a new movement of a civil society activists in Saudi Arabia seeking reform, recognizing that the path to the recognition of human rights is through a free and democratic Saudi Arabia. A number of organizations, myself included, and others represented in this room have um, stood up in support of that. Um, it's, a, it's a different way of getting at some of these issues. The people's vision. Uh, and then second, uh, my organization is trying something else new and different. You might have seen in the news yesterday, there was a lawsuit filed against Twitter uh, as part of the um, Saudi criminal enterprise for RICO violations under US law. Um, filed on behalf of Arija Satan and her brother Abdul Rahman Satan. Arija is a US citizen. Her brother Abdul Rahman had been living in the US um, when, he was at, when he was in Saudi Arabia. He was kidnapped, forcibly disappeared, and sentenced to 20 years in an unfair trial. Um, his crime was running a satirical account on Twitter, which criticized, among other things, the Saudi regime. His identity was unmasked by the Saudi agents who were working for Twitter, one of whom was prosecuted in, the, in criminal court last year in California. So Arish and her brother have filed suit against Twitter, against um, one of the agents, 
and, and other entities, as well as the unnamed defendant, Mohammed bin Salman. She's represented by her, her private attorneys, as well as my organization, the Freedom Initiative. Um, perhaps this will lead to some kind of accountability. Perhaps Abdul Rahman Saddam will be freed because of this lawsuit. Um, but it shouldn't take that kind of lawsuit for a Riyadh, a U.S. citizen, to try to get justice for her brother. And what I what I hope you take away from today is that all of these uh, th this failure to censor generous and foreign policy leads to people like Abdul Rahman being disappeared in a Saudi prison, and the tens and the thousands of others who are in political detention in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and around the world. Um, so until every politician, every member of Congress, every member of the administration believes that they were elected or put in office to further the goals of human rights, I don't believe that we will see a fundamental change. Thank you. Right, thank you, Andrew. Let's talk to you next. You're going to pull that mic closer to you. It's on for you, so you've got to be a step one. Here you go. Yeah, so you know, after the suppressive tool, uh, Presentation, I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> understand what I meant here, policy and diplomat, I think I have cooperation. Why didn't we see the CS stop it? Uh, uh, then establish uh, the NGO, my NGO, a very first for the say, human rights, civil society, and then to find out the reality, and that I want to discuss. So I will not mention anything. If they mentioned these two ladies, I'm far away from whatever they say. I will tell you the story of Syria that is clear what they were saying. So when the Syrian industry started, this really story, clear story. Uh, it's not I can, I was not talking about it, I think it's just a little background of the students, I say. When the Syrian industry started, there was big debates with the international community what to do with Syria. Because uh, at that time, Senator Kerry was running the east of the BDB, the of and as and the last day, the last day of the year, 2010, Assad and the Netanyahu reached the release agreement, and it was initiated by the Netanyahu and Assad. When the revolution started, the debate within the U.S. or within D.C., what to do now? Shall we support Assad? Was entered the Arab Spring. Shall we support Assad for be against Assad? So there was two messages, the public messages, as such as stop giving the people, blah, 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 blah. In the reality, we were sending different messages to say, you can be the hero, can be as peaceful as right, to can make reforms, everything would be fine. So for him, for Assad, he considered this as a real lot to go forward by killing people, because the head of the hunter table messages saying, you are okay. At least this one, Assad understood. The American, they were saying, it's not okay. But you, this, oh, this woman in Syria, who take out a bold region, we don't have overcame the same way he got, make some kind of free balls and make peace with Israel and everybody will be happy. But that didn't happen. So the second step. So the Turks jumped in. They were very close with Assad, and they came to the Warabola, uh, Erdogan. And he said, look back with Obama and Arnold that they said. And they said, what to do with Syria? They didn't know what to do with Syria. They said, you know what, let's be the time. And they put much, much more for acting when the people of Syria killed by Assad regime is five thousand. So it's not about time. It's about number of people who are being killed by Assad. Uh, hoping at that time there was minds wake out, something to happen. So the, the number is five thousand. And they didn't know what to do. So, a little communication between the Germans and the Americans, they raised the number of the cost. People that came by Assad in order to act, to think to act, that Assad, there's no way to, to do whatever to do. And the number reached to 10,000. And then the Americans say, how it's safe. There is no need, not until you use Russia, or the media for Greek dance, the Irish, Spain, this will be very great here in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Yemen. So we have to act, I think Assad say, not the you know, uh, Obama saying that Assad to step aside a lot of people. So he gave him space, you know, he can step aside and we come back there. And uh, for Assad, they say, it's I'm losing, I'm losing. It was learning from the models of Jimmy Shell when in the highly needed, he's fully vested, did the same him in Egypt with the Astiovari paying three many concessions to their people. And did the same him when Ali Abdul Asadif of Yemen buy back. And he didn't say that. So he said, whatever scenario I will do, I will lose. I'm losing. So I will fight back, I will fight attack, 
and I will fight back hard to put things on the other side. And that what happened, that what we saw a lot of destruction in Syria using the chemical weapons and all kinds of weapons you can imagine it, that it has been used in Syria. And here the three began with back to the ladies' conversation. At that time, for our bad luck as a Syrian, the, the deal in the Iran and the United States talked to the nuclear team, 2015, 2013. The process of moving the administration with all kids, tough fraud against Hassan and Botsukwai, they're talking with Iranian and they were thinking how to praise Iran, how to, how to give gifts for Iranian as a gesture. And it was you. So the, the administration that Kigabai's rules on what Iran are doing is real, well, they're doing it here, that they love my RGC, that Kalkiris will lie at the Shabi. They, they knew everything. They, they closed their eyes, you know, what's going to look in Syria. The administration at that time, they say, gives the advice for Iran and fake Syria. Will is we as the very careful we reach to see with Iran when they cannot stop up the salt. And the big of bad things is Aleppo Pat. So Aleppo was between IRDC and the Syrian and the nuclear deal in the end. And America decided to give Aleppo to the Iranian in order to get the need and they the deal for the return. So in the meantime, if you look about State Department, White House, DOD, think tanks, NGOs, humanitarian NGOs. Now they were loading us with the statement that we believe the Syrian on the ground. They believe, you know what, Africa is coming. The support, we don't get military support from the United States. They need more moral support, more st strong showing that the United States matching its foreign policy with its norms, the basic norms, human rights, basic norms. We end up not, not norms, but common policy. And today, uh, we reach to the Arabies. Uh, before the Arab peace happens, before Frederick Patrick Assad to the Arab peace, um, there was so many talks with the United States at the Assad regime. Some people published it from the Nomad, some people not published with Boston took you, board plus in the Arab that deal. And they made that they tried to reach out to the Assad again to say, what can we do to that? We have some American uh, kidnapped by Assad. One was enticed, the victim robbery, so they are, we were for Syrian Americans. And this had a deal on that. So can we, how can we make compromise like that? That's why it was really a big conversation. Because they had been declaring in that conversation more than 300,000 Syrians kidnapped by Assad regime at the second. So they were focused about three to four Americans, and they can't forget to exit another town. Again, when, when you hear that noise, you, then it become very difficult and very tough for all the serious to understand that the American have norms, or this American norms and values is for the American society only, it's not overseas society. And I think this is the reality, that American norms and values is maybe focused on the rights of the US. So US citizens have the right of everything as, as written by the laws of the Constitution. But when foreign policy, as you mentioned, that the human rights is a tool, it's not a nox. So they can use it here and they can solve it with for many different reasons. Political reason, political reason, and sometimes personal reasons. Personal reason because the politics at the end is a human. Some human being is doing the policies. That's the shit. So if the person hate the Sunni, Arab Sunni, his policy indirectly would address that it would be raw, non-Arab, not soon. It's politics. There were some people who are very much, they think Iran is the big nation in the Middle East, and the Arab people are the second degree. So they're, they're politics. It goes in that direction to give Iran much upper hand rather than the Arabs. And that's exactly what happens in the last 10 years. So politics is a human. And, and then we as a Syrian, we, we have reaching a lot of people here at this building, a lot of business, state department, that there's government officials. So on the human level, on personal level, I don't think there's anyone that say anything without we are not right. As a Syrian, people have the right to get their own lifestyle, to have their, the basic human right, basic of anything. Just to be live normal life, just any human <clears throat> being. There's no need to have other bonds or be kidnapped, chemical acts or or the whatever. Even today, with all the stashes between the Arab nations and the Syrian region, 
we have around 1.2 million Syria and Yemen, all of the same number in order, 3 million plus in Turkey, 600,000 million out. So only the neighboring country, we have around 7 million, 6 million Syria. And all this country, they have a lot of good relation with the set. They have dentists, the roads are open, the roads are open. And this kind of don't come back simply because they are, they fear of that regime because the regime didn't change its behavior. And today, I said, on these people in, in Arab summit, they were saying, we will not allow these people to come back till you give us money to rebuild what we destroyed. And they say it publicly. And we, when, we talk, when we look again to the United States, the superpower, with all the norms, all the muscles they have, they think, well, what? we don't feel. Basically, it's confusing messages. I mean, here we, as if we are, I'm uh, not hand, and here we are saying something, but when you go outside this building, we talk with any congressman, any senator, about Palestine, about any human rights violation, the whole Arab world, it's not Egypt or, or Saudi Arabia, in Lebanon, in Syria, Syria. Uh, then you, you, or not here, or personal government, everybody would, with that, I mean, that there should be protection of human rights. When you say, why did you act? I think here with the, really the interest come in. And I think fighting the norms without interest, you are losing. Mm -hmm. We should create an interest for the human rights rather than fighting for it as a norms. That will shift the things. If you go to Biden today, I tell him human rights in Palestine, or any Arab countries, he'll say 100% out with you. And then a minute later, he will get a letter from Boy saying, God, we have to show X billion dollars. They say, let's put this aside. <laughs> right. Or in Syria, they say, you know what, we have 300,000 Syrian at least in the Safir, and we have one journalist, American journalist. He say, you know what, I prefer the American journalist. I would love to start this 300,000. Yeah. And we, we are losing. So we found it. Sorry, I'm interesting now. I'm just telling stories because I don't have a background. <laughs> so I, I, think, I think we should match the interest in the foreign policy of human rights rather than defending it or promoting it as U.S. norms because this U.S. norms, my belief, is only for domestic use or for U.S. citizens, not for all business. Thank you. I want to tell you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry, Aaron. As you will notice, I lost my voice because I have my granddaughter visiting here for the last five days. So I'm sorry about that. And she will say, You look good. She's exactly the only day. And, uh, um, I'd like to be short and then we. Um, so, my main message today, or my, I'm the president the founder of Crystal and Talpil Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy. Um, I've been working in this field for over 30 to 5 years in promoting democracy to the human rights in the Arab world and the Muslim world. Um, so there is a big line, a huge line, in this time that we need to debunk if we really need to see progress. And that huge line is that dictatorships provide stability. This huge lie has been sold and manufactured millions and hundreds of millions of dollars to convince many people that dictatorship provides stability. <coughs> All the evidence in the last 60 years proves the contrary. Proves that dictatorships do not provide stability. So it is really mind-boggling how uh, many politicians and decision makers still body this lie that yeah, we need to support stability, which of course we need to support stability. Nobody is against terrorists, I think. But that somehow supporting dictatorships is the way to achieve stability. If you look at many countries today in the Arab world, many countries today all over the world, you will see that there is no stability because they have been ruled by dictators and dictatorships for the last 30 or 40 years. Um, so, it, uh, dictatorship 
gives you a fake stability, it gives you the impression of stability, but it's not real. It is a stability, stability until it explodes. That's the kind of stability that we are buying. It is short-term, very short-term stability. And it is fake stability because it's going to explode at any moment when we don't expect it. And nobody knows that it's going to happen. And when it explodes, we all pay the price. In terms of a human life and human suffering, but in every other way, either in monetary uh, financial costs. Look at how much the United States is paying just in one year in Ukraine. $35 billion just to try to save Ukraine, and they're not doing a good job, obviously, but Ukraine is being destroyed. So we need to debunk this idea that supporting dictatorship is the way Kachista did. This is the number one big lie that I think it's hard to fight because, again, it is funded by millions and hundreds of millions yes, from where? From these dictators. All these dictatorships and dictatorship regimes are paying hundreds of millions of dollars to the media, to lobbyists, to you know, anybody, uh, to think tanks in Washington, think tanks. Um, supposedly independent. Most of them now have been bought by UAE money and Saudi Arabia money. Most universities have been bought. Some of the top universities now receive hundreds of millions of dollars from UAE and Saudi Arabia. And so, of course, they will be very reluctant to say anything critical of UAE or Saudi Arabia when they are receiving tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. I was at the conference recently a couple of months at Harvard University. Harvard, probably the richest university in the world. But they had a conference and some of this conference or the center that was organizing this conference was funded by the UAE. So they had a whole panel in this conference on how UAE is such a model or the other world at Harvard University. So we really need to work hard to debunk this idea that dictators are providing stability. There is also another smaller lie, in my opinion, not, not as big, but smaller lie, which is that we need to focus <clears throat> on the human rights rather than democracy. I believe dictators love to talk about human rights because it's a cat and mouse game. You know, we have tens and hundreds of organizations all over the world that talk about human rights, but they are about one issue in particular. So the dictator state it gives them a way to, uh, to, uh, to play cat and mouse. Okay, you want to talk about women rights? Okay, we'll talk about human rights. We we'll put a woman as minister, or prime minister, or foreign minister, or we'll organize a big conference on human rights, so you get a work on being smooth. You want to talk about the environment? Okay, fine, we'll do a big conference on the environment. Even if we want to talk about political prisoners, I used to work in this field also, and sometimes we organize a campaign for a year you release one prison, a whole year campaign every day, we release one prison. And then what is the result? The, the regime will release that prison at the same day, will arrest 20 other prisoners. This has happened many times. Okay, all the attention goes to that prison, and all the media attention and focus and people blah. And the State Department talks about that and all that. Okay, he releases that prisoner. He gets a big thank you, as if he achieved something. You know, yeah, okay, this person was released. Oh, great. Everybody celebrated. At the same day, or sometimes even before he's released, 20 other prisoners or 50 other prisoners are, really, are uh, arrested. And then we have to work for another five years to release the other 20 prisoners. 
I call it a cat and mouse game. You know, we never win. The reason I defend democracy is the point. Democracy changes, or the goal of democracy is to change the system, not just one issue. It changes the system. The system is not dictatorship anymore, it is democracy. And that's how we can really achieve human rights, in my opinion, in the long term. Human rights has to be seen as part of democracy. And the fight is for democracy, not only for human rights. Um, we need a bigger vision. The world is a mess. Look at what's happening in all of the world, just Sudan, this found females are, what, two, three weeks ago now? You know what, we don't know how long it's going to continue, but it's because the army got involved in politics. And then the two generals did not agree on you know, how to govern. It's very simple. The generals will never agree, of course. And then it will have civil war, and people are dying. People are being killed every day. This happened in Algeria in the 90s. They had elections, and the Algerian army did not like the results of the elections. They canceled the second round of the votes. They had civil war for almost 10 years. <laughs> we don't know the number of people who died in those 10 years, but it's estimated that 200,000 to some people say half a million people died in the 90s in Algeria. But no. So we need to make, we need to get united first of all. We have too many organizations, each one working by itself. They are all doing great job, but each one working by itself to not get with us anywhere. We need to have a strategic vision and we need to work together. We need to become more united. And in my opinion, the goal has to be democracy, convincing the U.S. government, meaning, of course, the administration and Congress, that supporting democracy is the only way to provide stability and should be and must be in the, the priority in our foreign policy. The priority in our foreign policy. And that's how we will make this world a better place, if not for us and for our children. Granted, democracy is not a magic wand. It doesn't mean that in two years it's going to solve all the problems. I'm from Tunisia. We had democracy in Tunisia for 10 years, between 2011 and 2021. It didn't solve all the problems, but it was a, it was a true democracy. Tunisia was considered free, free of those 10 years by all the international organizations. The only other country that was free, meaning that you can say whatever you want and you will never be arrested for expressing your opinion. <clears throat> Just today or in the last two days, three journalists have been arrested for writing articles in Tunisia. One of them sentenced to five years in jail for just writing one article in Tunisia. So we need to work on convincing our policy makers, our decision makers, whether they are or the which in all you the them, of two things. First of all, dictatorship does not provide stability. And number two, democracy is the only way to provide stability and to provide peace in the world. In the long term, I grant you that in the during the transition, there will be problems. And democracy is messy, as we know. Even in this country, democracy sometimes is messy. It's not perfect. But it's a million times better than the alternative dictatorship or supporting dictatorship with the, the slide that somehow they are providing uh, or, you know, stability or economic development. While they are providing neither and the world, especially in the Arab world, especially in the Muslim world, is becoming more and more unstable, more and more dangerous every day. And I think that as American citizens, we are responsible for our foreign policy. 
whether we like it or not. We are responsible. And, and, and if we don't like it, it's our duty to get organized and to fight back and to improve our foreign policy. Last comment is, yes, of course, the United States is defending its interests, of course. I keep saying that I've said it for 20 years. The United States is not a charitable organization. You want charitable organization if you go to the NGOs and they do things for charity. I don't expect that from the United States. The United States has to do what it thinks is its own benefit, its own interest. I understand that. But I firmly believe that it is in our interest to promote democracy. That's why we should get promote democracy, because it's in our interest. And of course, also in the interest of the whole world. If we want a more peaceful world, a more humane world, with less wars, less suffering, less destruction everywhere, we will gain. It is in the interest of the United States. The simplest thing we will win is that people we love the United States instead of right now hating the United States. By the way, they all want to immigrate here, so they like the United <laughs> States in the inside. And the inside is great, but our foreign policy it is a disaster. And that's why a lot of them hate us because we are seen as hypocrites. If we change that, the whole world will love us again. And it is in our interest to do so. We're not doing a, a test of a charity, but it's an hour and just being to get further organized, and that's my advice to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I think this panel has uh, laid out why we have some pretty serious challenges with respects to uh, dealing with American foreign policy and what we have to do. Um, if you'd like to take some questions from the audience, if anybody has anything, I uh, see one up here. Okay, we've got one back here. <clears throat> Thank you all for your statements. Um, I have a question about Syria. So um, the Assad regime is turning to or increasingly using narco trafficking to uh, fund its activities, uh, specifically Captagon, which is produced in, in factories and smuggled across borders. So my question is, what is the United States doing to combat the illicit flow of Capagon? And by extension, what is the US doing to fight the funding of authoritarian regimes that enables them to commit these human rights abuses? Yeah, I'm not sure that's the question that, that really fits up. Yeah, this panel, I mean, the issue is there's not much that's happening. I mean, it's not really, um, I'm not sure anybody has an answer to that. Well, no. just quickly, just quickly, in that um, I think the same American community that we're pushing uh, the TV and and you those, it's just, it has been used by U.S. government, by U.S. Congress, uh, push the U.S. administration to put them down in these six months to deal with that. That to that may consider considering that the drugs is regulating for U.S. national security. So they are addressing that uh, issue from a new discussion. How to live, how to sort of this paper and all allied to the uh, And that basically, and what the law six. In the reality, what the union is doing on the ground, it's hard to know how to get away, especially that the Syrian drugs kept their going is moving food, but up every day. With the Arab beings, they send them aid from the Southern, the Arab city. So I have to answer this. You have another question back there? I'm going to tell you, I can hear that pain. My question is for uh, Professor Sahar. So if the U.S. administration needs to ensure that Arab leaders are going to uh, keep their interests in the region and they, keep, they need to keep their hegemony in the region, uh, how is any change in the status of human rights going to happen? Is there any hope that the U.S. is going to put the interest of the uh, people in the region first? That's a good question. So if we believe that our, we live in a democracy and we take that seriously, then it's up to us as citizens. I mean, to the extent that this country is, the foreign policy is shaped, at least in large part, uh, probably not exclusively, but in large part, 
by what its citizens uh, desire in terms of how they vote, in terms of how they, um, you know, what they expect from their elected officials, then we have a tremendous role to play, but it's an opportunity that we've been missing for generations, which is what Andrea was talking about and other panelists. Uh, we're asleep at the wheel. I mean, I think most of the, the influence comes from in us within this country. But that's not an easy challenge for reasons that were stated, which is most Americans, well, most humans, most citizens of any country are not thinking about what's happening far away. And so the, the real challenge is trying to convince as many, you know, a majority of Americans that it is in their interest, it does affect them when our country supports autocrats, does not hold um, our allies accountable for human rights violations, does not even subscribe <laughs> to many international tribunals that are intended to enforce human rights violations, such as the International Criminal Court. So I think the, the first step is for us to, to do that. Um, just the, the other issue is, well, I would be remiss not to lament, because it, it's still very depressing to think about. We had such a historic opportunity in 2011 when our country could have been on the right side of history because the people of the Middle East, especially in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Yemen, in Syria, um, I mean, Syria was a little bit more complicated, but certainly in Tunisia, Egypt, and Yemen, they did what we thought was impossible. They did, they freed themselves. They took enormous risks. They did something that I don't think anybody, that this country would not have done, or it hasn't done at least since its founding. And what we could have done and what we should have done is intervene in ways that actually supports their indigenous democratic processes, as Red Juan says. We're clearly interventionist. I don't think we're ever going to be non-interventionist. We need to just accept that. And perhaps that's part of being a superpower. But can we be interventionist for the common good? Can we be interventionist that actually is consistent with what our ideals and values and principles are? And I think this is where we, we utterly, utterly failed. But again, that was 10 years ago. And at this point, we have to look, we have to look ahead. But the short answer, and it's not an easy thing to do, but I think it's the most effective thing at this point, is to get Americans to care about foreign policy and to make them see the connection between support decades of supporting dictatorships and the rise of global terrorist groups, to get them to understand the connection between attacks on our US military, attacks on our embassies, attacks on, on us as a country by non-state actors and not dismiss them as whether well, these are rational people or just a bunch of criminals, but actually try to understand, oh, there's a reason why they hate us, and it's not simply because we're America. It's because we have directly contributed to making their lives miserable, right? That's on you. I would say, I would continue what she says in a practical way, away from, <laughs> i tell you about Syria. Uh, one of the major disaster we have in Syria is the, the interest for the superpower in the United States when they look into the Syrian revolution. When the Syrian revolution started, it started very severe. We have to talk about dignity, human rights, equality, civil society. I mean, this kind of just basic norms on people that go to the street. The, the major problem, disaster we have with the Islamists, they take over the, the revolution and change all the slogans to be established. That was the turning point, the big turning point, the ugly and point of the revolution. So from the US and the Western countries where they were looking about a group of people who were talking for severe civil society, the norms that we talk about, suddenly they moved to slogans that has too much distance and they hosted Islamist military group, then Islamist and so on, you know. So from DC and the Western country, they say which is better, the Hassan, the ugliest guy that we know he's serving our interest, no matter how ugly that our interest is, or this people, Islamists, immature, connected to a tourist group, 
and we don't know who are they, I don't know if they are representing the people, you know, that goes to the circles, which reach out to say, we don't care, we keep asset. I think exactly what happens. I hey, today. Okay. Yep, I have something. So, so, this one, so my point is, if we want to promote, help our countries, it's not about democracy and the human rights. It's about teaching the guys over there what the interests, how we empower our own national interests as Arabs, and how we try to match the outside interests, because this is not a charitable world. world. It's re literally, it's business world. So, um, but Sam is speaking about the Syrian experience, I'm speaking about the Tunisian experience, and it's not the Islamists in Tunisia, that was not the problem. Because the Islamists, first of all, they were very moderate, as all of you know, Sheikh Ashraf and Nushi and the Namba. A lot of people said, what makes the Islamists, you're almost a sector, you know, so they are very moderate. So that was not the problem. Uh, more than that, not the last the elections in 2014, and since 2014, it is a secular party that to this that has been ruling from 2014 until the coup happened in 2021, seven years. Now they really ruled only two years, 2012 to 2013. And in reality, Tunisia received more assistance from the United States and the international community. When another was in power, when the Islams were in power, more than needed Tunis afterwards in those seven years. So in, in the case of Tunisia, it was not that the Islamists were in power. That was not the problem. It's just that we do not have an agenda to support democracy. That's it. We don't have as our goal in the United States, in the State Department, in Congress, to support democracy. In Tunisia, we gave 200 million assistance per year, which is nothing per year to this next in democracy. 70% of that went to the army and the police during the democratic transition. 70% of our assistance went to the military and the police. We don't, we don't have a priority to support democracy. And in Tunisia, it wasn't the Islamists versus secularists. It was whether we really cared about democracy or we care more about fighting extremism and terrorism and strengthening you know, the army and the police in order to fight extremism and terrorism. And that's all we did. That's what dominated the assistance and the support to Tunisia. And democracy was dying because we did not provide any economic support to, to sustain the economic, the economic situation in Tunisia, which kept getting worse and worse until the pandemic hit. And when the pandemic hit, the economy, you know, basically got much worse. And that's why we had the coup. Can I? I just want to add one thing. I think we have to understand that probably, well, clearly an overwhelming majority of Americans have never visited a different country. Um, if you take Canada and Mexico out, it's probably 80 to 90% of Americans have never been outside of the United States as a whole. Um, 80 to 90% of Americans do not know a second language level of a third language. Right. Um, so when we talk about political power, when we talk about engaging in the process, the reason we're sitting here, you, you know, I look around this room and I give you on the bet virtually every single person in this room has been to three, four, five countries or more. Um, no one, two, three languages or more, um, which is a very small subsection of our society. So when we take a look at the programs that we engage in, when we talk about how do we lobby, how do we reach out, how do we change U.S. foreign policies, virtually everybody in this room is an American citizen, but we are a very small part of that citizenship that has to engage a very large universe of people who are protected by a island, uh, what the United States is, two large oceans with a huge navy that protects us. And so we don't necessarily feel the pain until there is a terrorist attack, and then we turn around and say, well, let's send our men and women off overseas to fight that fight over there. So I think that this panel has been extremely valuable in the sense that we're talking about the challenges um, that the inconsistency of American policy. Um, you know, we take a look at the balancing act that our politicians have to play with regards to, you know, um, real world politics versus principles of human rights, of democracy. Um, but there's a huge educational challenge that we all have 
and then what's one of the reasons that the National Interest Foundation does what it does? The reason we're all sitting in this room, uh, many of you belonging to different organizations, it's not just down to ourselves that's important. We have to be reaching out and bringing in other people to the table to understand the challenges that are ahead of us. And so I think that one of the things that I will summarize because lunch is waiting and there's nothing worse than being the last speaker between lunch and, and the fruit, is to say that I, I would just encourage everybody to continue to engage. You, we'll have you to ask the last question. We'll, we'll continue to engage to make sure you bring other people to the table who've never been before because they need to understand. Most people don't even have a, any idea what's happening in the Middle East, even though we've just gone through two decades of some very hard, serious issues of wars and and problems and still most of our earth has gone down. Let's close with that question. Before you do that, I just want to I want to bring up just two points. The first is we have a structural problem in education. This is one of the most provincial education systems in the world. So if you want to you want to solve the problem, make sure that every student has to know at least two languages fluently. But I, I just want to point I want to point out what Red Juan said. Supporting democracy is not the same thing as supporting democracy conditionally if the people we want to win, win, and if they don't, then suddenly it's not democratic, it's, all, it's flawed and it's autocracy. We have to respect other countries' sovereignty, and we have to respect that they're going to go through their own processes, just like we did, where we had an authoritarian in the White House. He's an authoritarian in terms of personality, in terms of attacking the judiciary, in terms of attacking civil society. I mean, the list could go on. But what we had in place was institutions and a system that could remove him nonviolently. And we have to allow other countries who never had the opportunity to develop their own democratic systems, in large part because of European colonialist powers, which we've now replaced indirectly, to go through that process and then think, how can we intervene in ways that supports the process, the values, the, the, the indigenous cultures, which does include Islam, and there's nothing wrong with that. And you have to let the Muslims hash it out intellectually, politically, to figure out what is the role of Islam in their societies. And that is their dispute to have. And we can't sit there and impose our separation of church and state on them, which is very much about the Protestant Reformation and the disputes between the Catholics and the Protestants in the church and society in Europe, which we're superimposing on a different part of the world. So it's, it's really figuring out what are the key principles that guide us and then sticking to those principles. And of course, none of that is going to happen if we don't have a, a population that is informed, that is educated, and that is actually committed to the values that it's indoctrinated to believe in schools and actually expects its government to act on those ideals. Uh, if not, I mean, uh, you know, we can quietly start grabbing the issue, but continue for another 15 minutes, because I think it's such an important issue. And I, I think uh, I'll have to make... <laughs> we can uh, why don't you start grabbing the food just quietly so we can continue this? Now I want to echo what you said. I mean, he's right. Probably should do the next one in Kansas or something. Uh, in reality, really, most Americans don't know about outside uh, the world, and there are many reasons. It's the same in other countries. You go outside, they don't know much. Uh, but it's important also, I mean, the, 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 uh, this panel is about search a better approach, and we have to really find a better approach for this. Uh, many people in America think, for example, the Arab Spring failed because they don't deserve democracy. Fox News, for example, kept repeating that Obama helped overthrow Gaddafi, and it was a horrible mistake, and look what we have in Libya. In reality, really, Libya succeeded. Many people don't realize after Gaddafi uh, was overthrown, they had a functioning democracy in a parliament and a government. And things weren't going the right direction until Egypt, UAE, Saudi Arabia sent money and army and intervened. The Russians sent the, the Wagner group. And they brought people from Chad and from Sudan to overthrow the government in Tripoli. This is a fact. It's also a shameful thing that National Security Advisor for Trump Told, the, told Haftar 
going to triple it fast before we can stop it. I mean, the official position of the Trump administration was we support the government in Tripoli, but his national security advisor was trying to double the government in Tripoli. So this is a, a, a just a major problem with our foreign policy. Thank you. So why, don't, why doesn't everybody slowly start getting lunch quietly so we can keep going? And we'll, we've got a couple questions, so we'll just keep going. Go ahead. I hate to be the ladybug in the Persian bottle delaying your lunch, but... You're not, you're not. Really. <laughs> um, you gave us a Persian bottle, so we can cheat. Actually, um, some uh, very quick questions. Uh, one of them is for Dr. Azilis, because um, I felt like maybe I misunderstood. We portrayed a very negative uh, image about the United States foreign policy. Now, I don't claim it's perfect, but I mean, is it that bad? Like to the extent, um, like that's that's too much in my opinion. Um, I hope that this panel had somebody from Biden's administration or probably Obama's administration to answer back to what you what you mentioned um, uh, of allegations in a way. But so, um, if we want to say, like, how about the strategic national interests? Anyway, like, I'm, again, I'm not defending President Biden or anything else, but if you go ahead and push all the way down all the buttons, and we have other strategic enemies that are willing, looking forward, and pushing to get our strategic allies to their section. And this won't be like something we want unless you want gas prices, at nine and eight, you know, all this stuff. We all know about that. So that's, that's I mean, how would you echo on, on that? For, for Andrea, um, this really, I, uh, this is the first time I heard about this initiative, and I found like some interesting uh, names in that. But my question was, did the Saudi government echo on that? Like some of the, some of the uh, things that you mentioned, uh, I mean, they mentioned are really progressive. And I think, again, I'm not, talking on behalf of any, you know, any border, any government or whatever, but I think there are steps that um, they want to achieve, like they want to achieve, they're looking for, maybe, maybe not, like, is there any echo on from, from, from that government? Um, and uh, Dr. Masmudi, um, I mean, if, uh, uh, congratulations for reviving the power of no against your, your grand daughter, because <laughs> I know, you know, young says usually, but no, 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 so that made you lose your, your voice. If the price is that cheap, congratulations uh, on echoing that on foreign policy and saying no to dictatorship, I mean, that will be a very cheap price to pay. Thank you. Okay, well, let's oh, no, start before you, oh, yeah, it's the time that definitely will be. <laughs> So again, again, when you talk about Libya, about Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, I'm not here to defend anyone. I have see ideas that it's not for me. But again, when you look about the interests, uh, there was there was competition between Qatar, Saudi Arabia, that is the brotherhood, and the other town was Adas. And we are the neighbors in Yemen, Syria, Libya, Syria. I think we pay the price as a foundation because of that conflict between the two sides, Muslim Brotherhood and the Exo Brotherhood, and the absence of American leaders. So this is the plan. So from one hand, you say, why allow Turkey to take over Libya as Muslim Brotherhood group, and not allow Egypt to say, we need a second? You, you know, this kind of stuff. So my point will be back to where you start here. I think from Serious from DC, if I want to teach the Saudis or the any other group, group, is not to take the side. Talk about your country. Going to the interest of both countries. And don't try to get support from outside, because outside we use you as hijacked here or as a tool in the, the long term. This is exactly what happens with the Syrian. The Turks use the Syrian to compromise in the West. Everything. So, I'm really, really want to have one. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Um, well, you know, I think my fellow, fellow panelists essentially addressed that at the outset. Of course, these countries will say, you know, we're reformers. NBS loves to be seen as a reformer. Um, the simplest uh, illustration I, I would give to counter that is that at the same time as NBS allowed women to drive, you know, doled out as a benevolent dictator did the, the opportunity for women to drive, he imprisoned the women's rights activists who've been advocating for that privilege to make clear that it was a, a grant by his authority, 
not a right that they should have. And that those who oppose whatever his decision might be, whether it's that women cannot drive or women can, should be in prison for speaking out. So you, there, there has been so-called progress in Saudi Arabia in that women in particular have greater access to certain aspects of civil society than they did before, and that's a good thing, and that should be commended and should continue. But that's not the same as democracy, and it's not the same as the full realization of their, their, their rights. And, it, and that will never occur as long as you have an authoritarian in power. It's just structurally impossible. People may have the ability to do things, but having the ability to lawfully drive is not the same as having the right to, as a, a person in society, the right to engage the same way that, that others do in this case, women having the same rights that men do. So, I mean, on this initiative that you mentioned, did they answer anything? Because it looks like something very recent happened. Uh, well, the initiative was launched today, effectively. Um, so I, I don't know so the Saudi authorities have responded. Like, I wouldn't expect that they would have anything positive to say about it. But if they support a move towards democracy and the full realization of human rights, then, then that's a great thing. So <laughs> let's hope so. So how did you want to cover? Yeah, yeah. So I, I just want to remind, kind of bring us back to the center of the conversation, which was about human rights. Human rights is the floor, it is the baseline, it is the absolute minimum that we expect every country to follow, that you can't go and torture people, right? You cannot extrajudicially kill them, you cannot assassinate them, kidnap them, uh, subject them to chemical weapons. So regardless of whatever foreign policy, you know, we can get into the details and the mechanics of foreign policy, we have a moral obligation and I think it is in our political self-interest internationally for our country and every country, but our country bears a particular responsibility because at least for now, we're in unipolar international order. It's going to change soon. It's going to be multipolar and we're starting to see that shift. But as long as the U.S. is a ma either the, the biggest player or at least a major player in the international order, it has a responsibility to enforce those norms. And I would say that to any other major player in the international order. We can't require other countries to do that, but we can, and we have a unique privilege, is that this is a democracy for now, right? We're still a democratic system. So for us not to expect that, demand that, unelect people because they will not defend these basic, basic human dignity norms, it's, it's unacceptable. I don't care what, you know, whatever geopolitical interests there are. And I recognize the geopolitical interests in my discussion because I understand we live in, in, a, in a complicated world. So that, that's, and therefore, what does that mean? That means that the countries that we have influence over, some of whom are our foes, we do that with sanctions, some of whom are allies, we do it for, with foreign aid and trade, etc. We should make it costly for them, ideally prohibitively costly for them, to violate human rights. That this is al khat al-Ahmar. This is the red line. It's one thing to say, okay, you, well, we want to go into Libya because we think that our interests are there, and I'm not make, taking a position on Egypt's foreign policy. That's one thing. But it's a whole other thing to say, well, you know, if you want to torture people and let them die in prison because you won't give them basic medicine due to their illnesses, we'll just pretend like that never happened. That's just not acceptable. And I think we as citizens have to take responsibility that the blood's on our hands. It is on our hands. And we can't pretend like, oh, well, that's the Biden administration, the Trump administration, the Obama administration. What, I mean, my comments today were not about a particular administration. They were about kind of the arc of our foreign policy since World War II at least, right? And so that arc is not bending towards justice for the people of the autocratic uh, Middle East. Um, the, the second point I just want to make is, I think it's a red herring and it's expired to argue that it's all about oil because the embargo was 50 years ago. Oil, the source of oil has diversified tremendously. We have, in the United States, large reserves of oil. And we're, anyway, going into a new era, which may, which is a real threat, I think, to the Gulf countries of, of new energy that is no longer going to be as reliant on fossil fuels. So I think it's not simply about, do we, it's, I don't think we're going to have $9 at the, at, the, at the gas station. And in fact, what did 
Mohammed bin Salman do right before Biden was about to be elected? He cut the supply. Biden still got elected. The prices went up a little. We dealt with it. It's, I think that's somewhat of a red herring, although it's just part of, of the, the assessment. Um, but I think it's about principled foreign policy. It really is. What, what are the principles that inform our foreign policy? And are those principles aligned with our values as a democratic nation? And if they're not, then we need to change our school textbooks to teach our children that you live in a country that supports torture. You live in a country that supports um, you know, arbitrary executions. You, let's just be honest with ourselves and say all of that money, the billions of dollars that's going to military aid to some of these countries is being used against their own citizens not because they're you know, in self-defense, because they actually are a threat to the country, but simply because they don't agree with their government. Um, so I, I think that's really what the conversation should be about when we're talking about human rights. Now, there is a separate conversation, and it's an important one, but it's much more complicated, which is what is our foreign policy in you know, when you're dealing with what's, you know, do we, how are we going to interact with a particular government? How are we going to interact with a particular social movement or political movement? And that can be similar to our treatment in Europe, you know, how we deal with Europe, how we deal with China, and so on and so forth. And that is going to be up for debate. It's very complicated. Um, and I think that should be part of an open, democratic, transparent conversation. And ultimately, the elected officials are going to be held accountable. Robert, I don't think that um, the fight in the Arab world is who supports the Muslim Brotherhood and who doesn't support the Muslim Brotherhood. I think this is the core dictatorship again wants to portray their action or the fight in the Arab world in that binary vision, you know, are you for the Muslim Brotherhood or against the Muslim Brotherhood? I think the real fight, and it's not just in the Arab world, but as we can see now, it's in all over the world, is there is a fight for democracy and the fight against democracy, for dictatorship. And the fight is intensifying because people demand for democracy is intensifying. So the enemies of democracy are now putting a lot of money, a lot of resources to fight against democracy. The intervention in Egypt, in Libya, in Syria, in Yemen, and now in Tunisia is not because Saudi Arabia or UAE is afraid of the Muslim Brotherhood. Saudi Arabia and the UAE, in many respects, are more Islamic and conservative than the Muslim Brotherhood, and certainly than in Africa and Tunisia. So to say, oh, we're afraid of political Islam, Saudi Arabia created political Islam, and has one of the worst versions of, of political Islam, which is the Salafism. So the real fight is, are you pro-democracy or against democracy? That's the real fight. Whether the people of Syria or Egypt or Libya choose the Muslim Brotherhood or not, that's really up to them. That's not up to us or up to any other country to decide. That's up to them. And as I think um, Sa'ad so mentioned, they, they, have to, they have to learn mm -hmm. the game of democracy. And it takes time. It's not overnight. And democracy is a lifestyle. The yeah. <laughs> <laughs> real fight is are we pro democracy or are we against democracy? And let the people choose and let the people hold their governments accountable. That's how you will deal with the marks. So excellent conversation. Thank you all very much. I have a story. It's got to be a very quick story. We're now only up to the next panel. Very quick story. I'm very materialistic. I don't believe too much in the theories and the ideas because it's life even when it's just about our work. But uh, when you is ambassador in Syria 2011, 2012, he went from Damascus, he did build a work, he went from Damascus to the city of Kamara. And there was big civilian demonstration where they saw the American ambassador came, they told the American democracy, American values, they throw flowers on him, and so on and so forth. And 
that push up the Syrian revolution with the three, four because they thought this is American message. And the real message of that guy was, he wasn't appointed by the Senate. He was appointed by executive orders from Obama. And he wanted to tell the Senate I'm a good guy, so elected me. So the Syrian perception of democracy and all rights and American value caused the thousands of lives because a person, ambassador, if he want to be put down at home. I never have to my point. I fully respect my finances. We cannot push the people for unrealistic dreams of American interest or supporting the norms of American work ethic. As of that, there's interest much higher than that. Thank you. All right, let's go change our lifestyles. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>